Okay, I think I'll just get started just in the interest of time. So um, this is basically just to give a an overview of some kind of some stuff about uh, smart pointers in C++. Somebody asked me a question a couple of weeks ago that I couldn't answer. So I went looking at the implementation and found out more about the about smart pointers than I thought I could know. Um, so just basically what I want to do is just go over the, the, the concepts of smart pointers and how they work, and then look at how we apply them specifically in the standard C library and standard and shared pointer and auto pointer and a few different things like that. Um, so just to start off with a basic kind of class we have here with a constructor and a destructor that just print out the address of the object that's being constructed. And we can use this just to examine how smart pointers work over time as we go through the, the examples. Um, and the real problem that we're trying to address here is that you know, we create some object of some type here, and at some point later on, we have to delete it. And in the middle, there's this stuff that we need to do. And basically, memory management is hard. You need to kind of keep track of where things are, where references to things are, and make sure that when we delete something, we delete it once and only once when all the references to it are gone. So re reasonably basic problem. I think most people who wrote in C++ Go for any amount of time have probably banged up against smart pointers in some way, shape, or form. So. Um, the first thing we can do is we can use RIII to create a scope pointer. And a scope pointer is basically just a wrapper around a raw pointer. So we can see you have a raw, a raw pointer here. Um, and the only thing this really gives us is the fact that when the scope pointer is deleted, it, it deletes the object that it's holding onto as well. Um, we just override the member access operators and the dereferencing operators. So this pretty much just acts like a real pointer. And we can see an example of how we might use it. We just take our scope pointer. Um, we initialize it with something that's allocated from the heap. Um, we can use the dereferencing operators and the member access operators to modify and look at the object, at the, the, the content of the pointer. And when we run this, we get our kind of simple output. And we can see that our object gets created. This is the constructor we saw earlier with the um, printing. And then it just gets deleted. So everything is kind of nicely cleaned up here. We don't have any explicit deletes in the code. And our object gets deleted. Um, so. The restriction here, of course, is that there's only one reference allowed for each object. We can potentially move references around the place, but if we have more than one references, reference, things are going to go wrong. Um, so it's somewhat limited, but the standard uh, C++ library actually gives us a couple of different implementations of this. Um, there's auto pointer, which is deprecated, but just to have a look at why. Um, here's an example using auto pointer, and you can see it kind of gives light to the fact that we can only have one uh, reference to any object, or apparently so. So we can see we create our object on the heap. Um, we initialize our first single reference auto pointer with it, and then it appears we can create multiple single reference uh, single references to this. Um, if we actually print out what's happening in in with the actual with the values in these, we can see what's actually happening. We can see that as we construct each of these auto pointers from the previous value, the pointer gets stolen. From, so we initially create the value here, and when we look at all of our shared pointers or all of our auto pointers, there is zero apart from the last one. So the the, the copy semantics of this are really weird. It actually destroys the original object as you're going through it. So this is one reason why you don't want to use auto pointer. Um, and instead, what we have now is unique pointer. And if we try and create multiple unique pointers from um, uh, multiple references using a unique pointer, we just won't compile. So we can see that the um, copy constructor for unique pointer is deleted. OK. Any questions so far? That's clear. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so basically, uh, don't use auto pointer. Unique pointer is more useful. Um, the problem, of course, is that we still have this problem that we only have a single reference to everything. Um, and in order to get around that, we need to track references. And the easiest way to do that is just with a simple counter. So. Um, First thing we do is we can use intrusive reference counting, where what we do is we embed a reference count in the object that we want to keep track of. Um, and then we increment the reference count every time we have a new reference to the object, decrement the reference count when we lose the reference, and then when we finally have no more references left to the object, we just delete it. All nice and simple. OK? So this is the worst piece of template code I have here, sorry. Um, so what we do is we start off with a base object, which is we're going to superclass for each thing that we want to ref count. The template magic is just to basically make sure that we can't use this for anything other than ref counted objects. Um, and we have our normal kind of pointer uh, dereferencing and member access operators overloaded as we did before. And in this case, what we do is when we construct our reference pointers, 
we just increment the ref count of the object and we decrement in the destructor. And if we end up with zero references, we delete the object. We also provide a copy constructor for the um, reference pointer so that we can also just bump up the reference count if you're just treating them as standard objects that can move around. All right. All make sense? Okay, so really simple example. We have our foo object again here. Um, this time we have to subclass ref count, ref counted object. Um, we <coughs> still have our constructor that prints out everything. And what we do is we create one single object and we have multiple references to it. I mean, here they're all in the same scope, but they could be anywhere. And eventually what happens is that when all of these, or when this is run, we get simple, single object gets created, single object gets destroyed, and everything works nicely, right? Um, okay, so this kind of intrusive thing, it seems kind of quite basic and quite simple, but it's actually quite useful and quite powerful, and plenty of things actually really do use this. Um, if you can deal with the fact that you have to modify the types in order to keep track of the reference counts, it's pretty useful. Um, so Boost has an intrusive pointer template that you can use. Um, things like the Python interpreter use this internally for all their objects. They, Python uses uh, reference counts for doing things like garbage collection as, as well as uh, mark sweep garbage collection. Um, and there's lots of things in the kernel and in C++ templates and stuff like that, and C++ frameworks that do something similar. All right. Um, so if we want to actually get away from this kind of intrusive system, then we need to look at doing non-intrusive ref counts. Um, and I mean, the obvious thing that we can do here is that we can put a reference count in some separate object. Um, and what we do is that we keep a reference count in a separate heap allocated block from the thing that we're trying to keep, keep track of. Um, and this way we can use pretty much any type, whether it's something that we've gotten from somewhere else or something we write ourselves and keep track of it. So here's our class this time. We just have our reference count object and we have our shared pointer. And this time our shared pointer actually has two fields. It has, a point, it has the, the raw pointer to the object we're trying to keep track of and this rep count thing, all right? Um, when we construct the shared pointer this time with a raw pointer, we need to allocate one of these new rep count things that we can keep track of, it, all right? Um, and we just keep the copy of the pointer. When we construct our shared pointer from an existing shared pointer, we just bump up the reference count in the ref count object. And then we do the same thing for the deleter when we're in the destructor. When a ref counts at zero, we just delete everything, both objects. Fair enough. Okay, so this is just a little picture of it. So pretty basic. We just have our two shared pointers. We can see our ref count for our object has a reference count of two. And then you've got the individual fields in this, right? Okay, so and again, if we do a little example of how it works, we can have our two shared pointers, S1 and S2. When we run this, we get our expected output. We have our two objects, or one object gets created and then deleted and everything gets cleaned up nicely. Fair enough. Okay. So just to go through some of the issues of this, um, not only this needs an extra heap allocation. So um, when, when a lot of this kind of stuff was initially conceived, like the idea of malloc and free is being pretty much cheap and for malloc and free were considered to be pretty cheap. Um, when modern systems, they can become quite expensive, especially with threads and stuff like that. They're, they're, it's it's non-trivial to allocate memory a lot of the time. Um, because our shared pointer now has two fields and it has two pointer values, so they're more expensive to pass around. Um, you can potentially get around that by doing extra indirections, but in general, there's going to be a runtime cost to this. All right. Um, and the other problem is that if you really try hard enough, you can create multiple uh, control blocks. Control blocks are what's holding the reference count. So we can see, for example, if we do a heap allocation, we can actually create two shared pointers referring to the same object. And if we do this, we have a bad time because we create this object and then it looks like we're deleting it twice. All right. So this is kind of something that's quite contrived. You wouldn't normally do this. You'd normally kind of create or allocate the foo object as you're kind of creating the shared pointer, but it's potentially possible to do this. So the, if you're using the the, the, in, the, the intrusive reference counting mean. So for the intrusive reference counting, well, okay. If you're reference counting the objects, then you're going to take um, the hit for, <clears throat> it, well, if you don't add in a reference count into the object and you don't reference count it, then there's no cost. If you add in the reference count and you don't always use it, then you're incurring a cost on that side. Um, if you're doing this, there's two heap allocations, which is quite expensive, right? Um, but there is a, a way that we can kind of avoid the extra heap allocation. 
and we come to that now in a couple of minutes. Okay, so this kind of brings us to the standard shared pointer is implemented in the standard library. And this example looks pretty much identical to what we did with our own kind of simple knobby implementation of it, but we just create these two STD shared pointers and it does exactly what you'd expect, all right? And the diagram is pretty much the same as it was before. The field names are slightly different, but pretty much the same thing. We have this M counted base object, which holds a reference count. It has some other things in it as well, which you look at as we go ahead, but we can see that it's pretty much the same diagram as we had before. All right. So in terms of then the heap allocation issues, one of the things that we can do here is that we can have a look at actually what gets allocated. So what we do is we can override the global operator new and operator delete. So we can see what actually gets allocated when we do this, all right? So there's nothing in the normal runtime startup that's going to use these. So we can see pretty much just the overhead that we're adding in, okay? And our simple program is just going to create a single shared pointer and from a, an allocated object on the heap, all right? And if we look at the output from this, it might be surprising. We get our four byte allocation here. Um, we then call the constructor for a foo object. And you can see that this pointer is the same as this one. And then we allocate a further 24 bytes, which is probably more than some people would expect here. And then eventually we just delete our object as everything goes out of scope. So we've, that's our two heap allocations. The object that we allocated just had a single integer in it, so it's only four bytes in size. But the control block that has the reference count is 24 bytes. Right, so you can see there's quite an overhead to this. So we can instead use this make shared function, which the standard C library, C++ library provides. And what this will do is it'll actually create a, or do an allocation of a single block. If you can see what happens here, what we do is we get a single 24 byte allocation, and then we create our foo object with the constructor here. And you'll note that this BE80 <coughs> pointer is actually inside this 24 byte block, all right? Like, it's actually curious that this is actually still only 24 bytes, but it now has enough room for this foo object. And we can see as we go through later on why that actually happened. Any questions? And we clear up. Yeah. yeah. So for the multiple allocations, you ever notice problems with cache locality? Uh, is, is that another advantage to this approach that you just discussed? So yeah, if, you, if, if, if you're going to be touching the reference count at, at the same time that you're accessing fields, yes, it would be an issue. Um, there's problems with this approach as well that we get to as well, but it's kind of, it would depend on the case that you're talking about, but it could be an issue. What is this for? Uh, four. It's just an int. Okay. I can't even remember. I think this was compiled on 64 bits. So, okay. So <clears throat> we look at what's actually happened in this case. We've just really allocated this SP counter base to say, and we've got room for that and our foo object. And you can see that the internal pointers and the shared pointers are just pointing to different parts of that single allocate heap allocated block. All right. Okay. So the next thing we kind of think about doing is that if we're going to be passing around these shared pointers pervasively in a piece of code, we find that a lot of our interfaces are going to take these shared pointers for everything. And if you end up in a situation where you're trying to implement a method in an object that is passed around as a shared object, shared pointer, um, you have the problem that you can't store a shared pointer inside your own object to yourself, because now you've created a reference loop, you're referencing yourself, okay? Um, so the library provides this shared from this uh, type. And what this does is it provides us a, an ability to call shared from this, right? So this is the type that's enabled shared from this here, right? And in this case, what we do is our foo object needs to inherit from std enabled shared from this for foo. So this is this curiously recurring template pattern. Um, and now what happens is that when we call, when we want to call a function like, you know, f, which takes a shared pointer to this, we can just get a shared pointer to ourselves by calling this, right? And you can see it working here. We have shared pointer created, and then we call our method on it. And in this case, it'll work. The only problem is that we can't do this. So this makes no sense if we've actually created a raw <coughs> foo object or an object on the stack, and we try to access this member, it'll crash. And we can see the output. We run this, we can see that the first object, we call that, it works. And then we don't actually get to call the method on the, um, or not, we don't get to call that in the second case, we get an exception here. All right, makes sense? Okay. Okay, so that kind of covers the, kind of the basics of what shared pointer does. We also have this idea of a weak pointer. So a weak pointer is something where we can 
keep a reference to um, an object that is also in a shared pointer and it kind of acts like a raw pointer, but it's safe in that once the shared pointers, all the shared pointers go out of scope, you can no longer convert the, you can no longer get the shared pointer value out of the weak pointer. All right. So the way we actually use weak pointers, we just convert it into a shared pointer as we need to use it. And if the object has already been deleted, that either throws an exception or returns null, depending on how you actually go and do, go about doing the conversion. Okay. So this is kind of used, you can prevent reference loops in it. And it's just generally useful when you need, when you think you need to, uh, to use a, a raw pointer, it's probably what you want to use instead. Um, so we can see a quick example of how this works. And um, we have a function here, test week. And what test week does is it calls this week.lock function. And this is how we convert from this weak pointer that was passed in into a shared pointer. And we just print out the actual numeric value of the pointer that we've got. Okay. And in our main function, what we have is we've got a weak pointer at the outer scope, a shared pointer at the inner scope. And um, we assign shared pointer to the weak pointer. And then we test it. So when we test it first, shared pointer is still in scope. So we get this. We can actually see the pointer value here. Everything works nicely. Once we leave this block here, well, the shared pointer is now out of scope. There's no more shared pointers left to that object, so it gets deleted. And we can see it getting deleted here, and then the call to test week. And now we can see that the shared pointer is null and gone. Okay, so if we had this as a raw pointer, obviously we'd still have a reference and we could still indirect through it and still break everything. All right, no more questions? How does it know that the shared pointer is deleted? I'm going to get to that right now. <laughs> so, as you know, how does the weak pointer keep track of what's been deleted, right? So now we're going to kind of start to work out why we have this 24 byte control block. So what we have is we've got our, in this case, I haven't used make shared in this case, right? So I have a separate foo object and I've got my SP counted base. So I've added in this other field, which is called the M weak count, right? So I have two pointers, which are weak, two are shared, right? And I have a use count of two, that's for the two shared pointers. And I have a weak count of three. Now, it's a bit confusing that the weak count is three and not two, but what happens is we take a, a, a count on the weak reference for all of the shared pointers together. So when the shared pointer reference count goes down to zero, it decrements one off the weak. All right? Are weak pointers the same as shared pointers? All of the all of the operations on the counters in the control block are all atomic, yes. So for the weak, yeah, it would be around the same. There's not much in it. I didn't measure it, but it's not it's a wash. There's not going to be a huge difference between them. Um, you can see, I mean, the contents of them are pretty much the same. They have a, a pointer and a ref count on the, this MPI thing, and it's just they increment a different counter. Uh, you can Right. Right. Sure. Okay. So you would you, you would you, you the main use you would have for it is probably to avoid reference loops. Where I say you had a tree. Yeah, so if you had a tree or something, you might have uh, smart pointers to your children, but a weak pointer back to your parent or something. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we can see what actually happens here is that if we delete all of, if, if all of the shared references go away, we can, and we're just left at weak pointers, we're still left with our weak count being two, but we have our memories being freed. Um, so when you're converting the weak pointer to a shared pointer, you can see that the reference count is zero. So you can't safely do the conversion to a shared pointer. Um, and you can see that we've actually got the two separate memory blocks. We need to maintain the control block, but we've freed the actual object that we were trying to keep track of. All right. So there's a couple of obvious problems here. Um, make sure it obviously interacts badly with weak pointer, or at least it can. So if you have a very, very large object and you use weak pointers with it, um, if we look at the previous example here, you know, if, if we were to use, if we had used make, make shared here, these two objects would be act, would be taking up the same heap, heap allocated block, both the um, the control block and the object to keep track of. So in that case, even with your weak pointer, you can't actually free the object. We can see that in, in, in practice here. What we do is we get a weak pointer. 
we've got our operator new included here so we can actually see the output of the allocations. So we have our weak pointer. We create a shared pointer in an inner scope, assign the weak pointer to the shared pointer to the weak pointer. Now we see the shared pointer goes out of scope and then the weak pointer going out of scope. So we can see here what happens is that we get our 24 byte allocation, which is for both the control block and the object. We can see our constructor gets called and then we can immediately see the destructor gets called as well. So when we leave the inner block, we know that the shared pointer has gone away. We know we can call the destructor for the object that we're keeping track of, but we can't call free on the memory that it's occupying. So we see that when the shared pointer goes out of scope, so even the weak pointer finally, just as the weak pointer goes out of scope, we actually free the byte associated with it. So you do get the benefit of having the destructor for the object called while there's still weak pointers referring to it, but you can't take use of the allocated memory as long as they're in the same block. Okay, so that may or may not be an issue depending on the size of the object you're managing. Why do we need, why do we need the control? Why do we need which? Um, I can't remember. Um, I know that quite the way the, the way the interface works is that every time you, when the, when the reference count of the shared pointer goes down to zero, so when the, when the actual reference count goes down to zero, then you decrement the weak count. And if the weak count goes down to zero, you free the control block. So it's kind of just, it's one of the cases where you need to free the control block is when all of the shared pointers are going away. The other reasons you need to delete the control block are when all of the weak pointers are going away. So it's, as you imagine, the last shared reference goes away. At that point, you may need to delete your control block. I mean, you could probably do it by checking to see if the count was zero, but the, I don't even know if you need to make it atomic. I think it's it, it's just a, it may it may make it easier to make it atomic because it's it's an atomic operation rather than testing to see if it's zero and then going on. But I'm not really sure. Um, okay, so this actually also explains how enable shared would work. Um, enable shared really just is this this is basic this is actually from the header file i've cut out some of the private members and stuff like that but you can see it's really just a uh, class that has a mutable weak pointer here right and it just works by converting the weak pointer to shared pointer as you call uh, shared from this all right okay i can't remember what's coming up next on my slides okay yeah so some of the actual gory details of implementations and the oddities of how all this stuff works. Um, I mentioned thread safety before. So basically, the way you can kind of think about this is that the operations on the control block where you have the reference counts are generally atomic, but individual shared pointers are not. So you can't modify an instance of a shared pointer from two threads simultaneously, but you can take references and copies of references to data from other threads from a single shared pointer. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and this was something that one of the guys here, Pavel, actually pointed out to me. Um, and it's a kind of a curiosity about how all this stuff works. But we have two basic classes here. And I notice they both have destructors that are not virtual, right? And one derives from the other, obviously. Um, and if I run this, when I have a create a shared pointer and a unique pointer, two different instances of it, does anyone care to guess what it prints? No media takers, so I'll just go and show you. OK, so first thing is that this one will get destroyed first. And then this one. So the first line is the output from the unique pointer getting destroyed. Second line is from the shared pointer getting destroyed. All right. So in the case of the unique pointer, I just call the base class this destructor. All right. Um, now I created it as with, with this with this uh, heap allocated object. And this is the template type. Right. So for the unique pointer, all of the typing information is held in the template itself. There's nothing at runtime. All right. And for the shared case, we can see that. Even though there's no reference to the derived type here, we still get the derived type destructor call, even though it's not virtual. All right. And it kind of seems a little bit non intuitive, but if you actually think about how this would work in reality, when you've got like a lot of different objects lying around, if you had, say, two different types, two different functions here, right? In this case, we have a shared pointer in the outer scope, a shared pointer, in the, a shared pointer to the base type in the outer scope, and a shared pointer to the derived type in the inner scope. And we've reversed them around here, so they get deleted in a different order. So, I mean, in this case, you can lexically see which way they're getting deleted in. But if you imagine there's a system at runtime where different objects get created and destroyed at different times and different references get created and destroyed, it would be very non-deterministic to work out which particular type of destructor was going to get called from for the same object. And depending on the order of destruction of the actual of the references themselves, the object would be deleted differently. 
Okay, so this, the only sane way for this to work will be for the two of them to have the same thing, which they do. Okay, making sense? All right. Okay, and the way we implement this basically is to have a virtual function in the uh, control block itself. So when we construct the control block, I actually go back a little bit, actually show you. Um, actually, we'll go back. No, I won't go back any further. Okay, so yeah, when we create the control block, um, we basically create it based on the type that were pa that passed it as an argument into the shared pointer constructor, not the type of instance, the template instantiated with. All right. Um, and at this point, we're kind of close to having a full picture of the contents of the shared pointer. So here is our SCD shared pointer. We have two of them. Here's the control block, and now we have added in the V pointer. We've added in the use, well, we have the use count we've already seen. We have the we count we've already seen. And actually, the, this SD counted pointer object actually has a pointer to the object itself, as well as the shared pointers. That seems redundant, but we're going to see why we can make use of it in a minute. All right. Um, so exactly, why do, we, why do we have this distinct pointer? So for some cases, if you've got multiple inheritance and you've got um, the pointer to this may be different depending on which particular subtype you're talking about. All right, that's one reason for it. Um, make shared, we don't actually need to allocate this MPTOR for make shared. So this, this, this type here, SB counted pointer, is one of a number of different subclasses of the actual type, which is SB counted base. There's one for shared pointer, there's one for make shared, there's one for when you use a, a custom destructor, a custom deleter for the object, and a few different cases. All right. So I didn't go into the custom de deleters, but it's relatively easy. You can just basically pass in. <laughs> A function to get called when your shared pointer goes or when your object needs to be cleaned up. The other interesting thing that we can use is the aliasing constructor. All right. So the aliasing constructor is one of the other things that I kind of only found out about in the last week. And this is what the aliasing constructor for a shared pointer looks like. So here's our type for shared pointer. And we have a constructor that takes another shared pointer and a raw pointer. Okay. But in this case, the shared pointer that we take in as an argument is for a different type Y. So we're constructing a type or a shared pointer for a type uh, T, but we're passing it a, a shared pointer of type Y as an argument. And what actually happens is that if, for example, we create a type of an object of type bar with this, right? Um, the constructor will actually use the control block for the first object past object, which is the object of type foo. So although when you can when you when you get the pointer value out of it, it's to the to the bar object, the resource the, the object whose resources you're tracking and who that you will free up when everything goes out of scope is in fact the foo object. Right? Now it sounds crazy, but there is actually a reasonable use case for it. Um, so if you can consider say a tree, and you, I haven't actually built in the details of what the tree looks like, but I've just got nodes and a tree. I've used enable share from this because it makes sense here. Um, I have a vector of nodes in my tree, and I put in one node that's to represent the root of it, okay? And I have a method called get root, all right? And the get root method on my tree, what it does is it just basically takes the last node, the first node in the, uh, in the vector and returns it, right? But what I, use, what I do is I use this um, shared pointer constructor. What I do is I pass, or use the alias constructor. I pass shared from this as the first argument. So this is an object of type shared pointer to node, shared pointer to tree. And I return a, a return a shared pointer to node. All right. So if you think what I've done here is I've created my node object, which points to the tree's uh, control block. So when I go and create a tree, so in this case, what I do is I just create a single tree and return the root element on it. All right. And in my main function, I can see that I actually leave the main. I, I when I've gotten out of get tree root, there are no more shared references or shared pointers of type shared of type for, for this type tree but there's a remaining one for type node. So although all the, all, the, all the tree shared pointers have disappeared, the actual tree stays in place until the node itself gets deleted. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, I think that's it. I think I've gone through everything. Yeah. None of this will work on the stack. 
because on the stack you've only got one reference. It's the one on the stack. That's the only that's the only one that matters. The object will always be created and destroyed if it's on yeah, the stack. Yeah, but oh, if you call if you call this on an object on the stack, it will crash. Sometime I don't know I don't know what point it will crash, but it will crash at some stage. Um, yeah, you, none of this will work on any for anything on the stack. You, you, there's, there's a there's a tacit assumption that everything here is in, in heap. So you allocate three objects to the stack, and so I don't get you. Yeah, like uh, you have concept or uh, this uh, invariant that really shouldn't be allocated to the stack, and uh, say you just okay. So yeah, I'd be curious. I mean, it probably be, at runtime anyway, you could probably detect that relatively easily. Yeah, runtime. Yeah. Will have an introduction. <laughs> Sure. So yeah, I mean, yes, I think it sounds like a probably reasonable uh, thing to add in. So I'm just thinking you could actually probably use this, um, the alias constructor with an object on the stack for the, 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 the this node type. Um, you might get away with that because it won't actually do anything with the node other than just give you raw pointers to it. But I don't think it would be something I would recommend doing in a hurry. Yeah. Sure. Right. So yeah, you can create. Yeah. So what he said is that you can create, you can avoid things being on the stack by having a create function that's public that calls a private constructor, and then you can't actually stack uh, allocate them on the stack. Do which do. <laughs> I'm not sure. I suppose if you call make shared from. A static function, you probably have access to the constructor. Oh, probably wouldn't. No, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer. I don't. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But no, I'm not sure. So, I mean, if you try and convert, if you have a weak pointer and you've kind of default constructed it, I'm sure you can't get a, a shared pointer from it. So I don't think you could tell the difference between a null and a weak pointer and a weak pointer whose um, resource tracked object had already been deleted. And you can probably put nulls in them, but it, it's just going to be the same as having um, no object left in it. No one else? Going once? Going twice? There's a typo here. Um, go back to the, uh, to the, <coughs> to the previous slide where you defined uh, base and drive. Oh, OK. Um, so I, 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 know it, I know all this works because it compiles. <laughs> um, not the alias constructor. No, it wasn't weak. I was in my start out with the heap. Oh, let me have a look here. You won't be able to follow this or what? Well, uh, um, the question is, I don't really understand why they are virtual. Why they are virtual? Yeah. They were not virtual. Yes. Um, OK, here it is. Maybe you can reiterate why it is happening. So this is non-virtual. Um, so this is non-virtual, yes. But the type. The shared pointer has virtual methods in it. And the type of the control block that it creates is based on the argument type, not on the type of the template. So it knows that this is a derived object and it needs to delete a derived object. Uh, I think it was simply um, blocked. No, it, it makes sense because if you don't do this, then depending on whether you've got a shared pointer to the base or a shared pointer to the derived type, and depending on the order things happen in, you would get different behavior. So the point is that you always destroy the object with the same function, regardless of what type the shared pointer that points to it is. 
it is, seems quite counterintuitive until you then look at this. I mean, what would you expect to happen here? I mean, you, you, you just, the only difference between these two things is the order that these two pointers get deleted in. I mean, if this happened at runtime, would you expect the behavior to be different? Okay. So the deleter is a little bit different, similar idea, but the deleter is kind of a, a further subclass of the the, the uh, control block. So there's different control blocks for custom deleters, control blocks for the in place where you've got to make sure, and then another one for the case we've got a row pointer. So it's similar, yeah. This is well-defined behavior. So that's the, the, the thing is that if you didn't have this, you would have very difficult to predict behavior because order the... Sure, so, so that, would, that would be true, right? But so, so if we have multiple shared pointers and some of them are to the derived types and some of them are to the base type, and depending on the order that the actual references get removed in, we don't want the behavior to change. Right, yes. I think it's uh, well confusing and defined. Yes. Confusing and defined, yes. Okay, so we learned lots last week looking at this. This is interesting. Any more questions again? Only once? Looking at Danny going twice? Um. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're using make shared when you create one heap allocation, then you can, when all of the shared references are gone, you can destruct the object, but you can't read the memory because it's still in the same block of heap memory that was originally there. You could probably, if you're really smart, you could probably reallocate with a smaller size after cop or something like that. But that would not necessarily be a nice thing to do. Okay. So saying unique pointer would be faster or weak pointer? It's the raw pointer. It's a non-only pointer. Right. And so basically you have some kind of register mm -hmm. of um, um, nodes for a graph, mm -hmm. um, which will uh, maintain the memory pointer for different. And um, you have uh, functions to traverse these nodes and they Mm -hmm. So I mean, you can you can do that, but it just means that if you mess up, you've got the possibility of indirecting to a, a freed object. But yeah, 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 you're perfectly free to use raw pointers if you want, and they work fine. Well, I guess the point was that you can have unique pointers in, in your data structure, like a tree, where you would keep the nodes as unique pointers, and then you pass off naked um, pointers to the functions, like the traversers or whatever. And that's a kind of well-established pattern. And it's much faster because there is like no uh, control block and there is no uh, reference. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, the implement, my, my, my tree and node is just basically an obvious example for the, the purpose of the demonstration. But yeah, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily yeah, implement things that way. Yeah, keeping the unique pointers as, yeah. yeah. Um, right. I mean, that's a very, no, very well-used pattern, I think. The last one, Jacob's side had a very large tree and uh, many nodes. And uh, basically allocated ones to vector. And while it was called, um, the references were like, I just worked with the raw pointer. <laughs> sure. They were supposed to be known only. So I don't have to maintain the memory. Yeah, it makes sense. I, yeah. just, I don't assume that I have to. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how, you know, when you have any pointer, even in like, uh, you know, method definitions, you will see that, you know, uh, that's this method will take the ownership of the pointer. Right. Um, whereas if you have something like a tree, the, the nodes, unless you have some sort of weird iteration, the nodes will always be owned by the tree. Sure, but it, it's very it. much based on the semantics of the thing that you're writing. So, I mean, it might be very obvious that when you're passing a raw pointer that it's just a borrowed reference, or it might not be. Right. But well, 
I mean, if you follow this convention, I mean, there's obviously there's nothing in the compiler to enforce that. Right. But I mean, if you follow this convention, um, I mean, it works out pretty well. I, as long as you get a read off the store and that reference anywhere. Right. But I mean, if you, if you look, say, I mentioned Python earlier on. So Python has like manual rep counting for all these kind of things. And if you've ever written a Python extension, you know, there's there are there's well defined conventions for passing stuff around, but almost every extension probably leaves some bytes of memory still allocated when it gets on when it gets freed up. I mean it's just it's too easy to get wrong. So I mean yeah, and if for some for some cases again it makes a lot of sense to use raw pointers and just saying, uh, I like my previous work, I I did a lot of uh, I, I used unique pointers and uh, raw pointers far more Far more than shared pointers. I mean, as it's rare that I would have used shared pointers. They're they're expensive to use. They're they're not cheap. They're not they're not for nothing. And also, like the ownership, usually it's kind of clear who's managing the life cycle of an object. And then when you do uh, you know more result to functions, you just pass a, a row pointer function does something some computation in it, and it doesn't own it, it doesn't destroy it ever, and that's it. Sure. So we have a framework within here that we know we all love that does similar stuff with shared pointers and has equal problems. Yes. Is there another question? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, can we remove a little bit of the overhead by uh, compiling without looking for the uh, so, so there's a there's a template argument for the uh, shared pointer. That's the type that you did for the I can't remember what it's called. It's like the um, the strategy for incrementing ref counts, I can't remember what it is, but there's like three different choices. You can use atomic atomic intrinsics, you can use mutexes, which I imagine is horrendously slow, and then you can just ignore it. Now, the problem is that STD shared pointer has already got all these template arguments instantiated. So you know you could probably change the header files and make it work, and it probably might be it might be that little bit uh, quicker. I don't necessarily think that at this point, um atomic reference counting when the Reference counts aren't contended is particularly slow anyway. I mean, there is an overhead to it, but it's not as big as you might think, as long as they're not contended. One last question. What do you think of um, primary management in Bob and what are the references? Um, I have the book, I've read most of it. I haven't written that significant, and so I, it seems like a clever idea. Um, I just I haven't embraced it. I haven't actually written something significant with it to say, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. My initial, my initial uh, findings with it was that when I tried to do stuff, I ended up just staring at compiler errors an awful lot, which is probably better than looking at core files. But um, yeah, it, it was, it was difficult. I found it difficult to write code, but it's probably because I'm not used to it. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm done.